Hello and welcome to C++ Weekly. I'm your host, Jason Turner. Now this episode is going to be a little bit different than usual. Uh, if you're new to the channel and you have new watching this video as your first one, I tend to do videos um, that are just mostly specifically about C++ code with programming, live examples, uh, walking through the standard and CPP reference and that kind of thing. And well, I've been producing them weekly now for nearly 300 weeks straight, which just seems crazy. But in this episode, I want to talk about a topic that I think is pretty important. And uh, I never really do this or very rarely do something like this where I want to try to um, convince you that it is important to do something for the sake of the community and for the sake of C++. So that is the title of this episode, which you would have already been aware of, of course, and that is Break ABI to Save C++. So we're going to cover some of what ABI is, what breakage means, why I think it's important for saving C++, and I just want to start right out by saying I'm going to be approaching this from a slightly different perspective than any of the other ABI talks that I have seen, but almost certainly the things that I'm saying are not unique but uh, I just thought that it would be a good idea to put this out here on the channel. So this will be high level. Uh, well, I mean, you know, it'll be mostly high level. I'm still going to dig into some Compiler Explorer examples. I will definitely gloss over some details. That's partially because I am not a standard library implementer. I am not a compiler vendor. There are things that I know that I don't know. And it's entirely possible that I'm missing something important here, but I believe I've heard most of the important arguments one way or the other. When others discuss the topic of ABI breakage, they tend to focus on things like this principle, uh, designing principle of C++, that it would leave no room for a lower level language. And well, we'll see in a couple of places, at least how theoretically not being willing to break API is a problem for performance, I'm going to mostly focus on best practices and why ABI stability is probably making your code in your company worse right now. Why we actually need to break ABI stability to help you move forward and have better code. Uh, you do want to stick through this whole thing. I know from looking at my YouTube stats that most people don't stick through a whole video because I am going to cover a way to move forward at the end and hopefully that'll be useful information for you. So what is the ABI? This is the application binary interface. I'll make these slides available later. If you want to, you can go and read what Wikipedia has to say about this. This is how our objects and types look to the compiler. Our compiler has to generate a layout, it has to generate something, it has to generate a, a protocol for ways that libraries and executables talk to each other. So some of the things that come up when we discuss ABI, the size, number, and order of data members in a type, the size, number, and order of virtual functions, that one's interesting, the number and order of function parameters, this one is probably the most obvious one. If you change the order of function parameters and you try to call it expecting an old order, then yeah, you're going to get the wrong result. Function return types. Now that one is also, to me, interesting, and we'll look at that, what that means. So let's look at what happens when we change the return type of a function. And of course, I have a Compiler Explorer link here. So I have this Compiler Explorer window up here. And I have turned off the demangle identifiers output option. And that's because we want to actually look at the fully mangled name. This is what actually gets put into the binary. This is what happens when you try to call a function called get value. This is what the library and the linker and the executable are all going to see and it's going to say well i've got an executable that's trying to call this function library do you have a function with this name so i've got one that has an int return and i've got one that has a double return now notice this is underscore z9 get value v 
if I uncomment the double version and comment out the int version, I still get z9 get value v. The return type is not part of the function signature. It's not part of our ABI. So this kind of makes sense because we can't overload on return type only in C++. But that means that if I've got a library and I change the return type from an int to a double and someone's using an old version of the header file but a new version of the library, then things can go very bad. So as I say here, it's not part of the name mangling. If the header doesn't match the binary, things go very wrong. So what happens when we change the order of virtual functions? Another Godbolt link. So I've got this very simple function called callfunc. It takes an object of type s by non-const reference, and it calls s.f1. Now these are pure virtual functions. So at compile time, the compiler has no way of knowing which function is going to actually be called uh, because it's going to be some derived version, derived class version of these functions. Now, if you've never looked at the way virtual functions are dispatched in C++, it loads a pointer from the V table for that object, which is based off of RDI. So RDI is the pointer to this a reference and a pointer look the same to the compiler. This is the pointer to the object of type S is in the value RDI. And then I'm saying, give me the V table, the first thing that's there. And then I want to jump into the value pointed to by RAX. So the V table is a table of function pointers. That's all it really is. And that's how virtual function dispatch works. Now I have these declared as F1 and F2. Now let's say hypothetically, the vendor of my library at some point, either intentionally or unintentionally, changes the order of declaration here. So now F2 comes first and then F1. I still think I'm calling F1, but notice that the compiler actually generated different code. It's now calling the function that is an offset of eight bytes. So it's calling the next function in the V table, the second function in the V table, not the first function in the V table anymore. So if our vendor changes their build, we have an old version of the header file or a different notion of this build, or we were built at one time and the library is built at a different time, and you think you didn't change anything at all, all you did was reorder a couple of virtual functions, things can go really bad. So if we change the order of virtual functions, the compiler will call the wrong one if we have a mismatched worldview. So what happens if we change the order of member variables? We're looking at basically the exact same problem with calling a virtual function. And that the compiler says, I want to get to the value of the first object. Now this one might be slightly more obvious. If I reorder these objects, it's now saying, well, I need the value of the second integer, which is four bytes offset from the first one. But what might not be as obvious to you, if you have never stopped to think about it, is by adding another variable here entirely, I have completely changed the way this type looks to the compiler. If I had these things in an array, well, now each object is 12 bytes apart instead of eight bytes apart. The size of it changes. The size that must be reserved on the stack for one of these objects changes. The size of a return value, if I'm returning one by value, changes. If I'm passing one into a function by copy, it's going to change the layout of the thing that's on the stack here. And again, that'd be really bad. You're like, well, all I did was add Z to my struct, surely my users can still use the old version of my, or use the new version of my library without recompiling, right? And uh, well, no, obviously no, they can't because you just changed the entire way that the compiler views your struct. 
All right, so why would we ever do this? Why do we ever get into a situation like this? Let's say that I've got standard lib version 1.0.0.0. And I have that linked to my old library A. And then I have an upgraded version of my standard library, 1.0.0.1. And it's got some little layout change in there that someone overlooked accidentally. And I have that linked to my new executable B. And I am trying to share data between old library A and new executable B. And they're sharing standard library types, like standard vector or something like that. Then, oops, things go wrong because there's some layout change somewhere. And this is, can be really insidious, it can be the kind of thing that you don't catch for like a long time afterward, or only once the code's been deployed to a client's computer or something like that. It's definitely bad news if something like this happens and there's an API break. So old library A and new executable B are speaking a different language and they don't even know it. Now, you know, somewhat jokingly, this is kind of like British versus American English. We have the same words that we use, but sometimes have a different meaning. And sometimes when a British person and an American person are speaking to each other, they would be like, you know what? I understand the words that you just said, but they make absolutely no sense in the context that we are speaking in right now, because we use the same words sometimes with different meanings. So what does having ABI stability gain us? To prevent ABI related bugs, our compiler and standard library vendors have given us this quote ABI stability for some time now. Visual Studio has maintained it from 2015 to 2017 to 2019, and they're planning uh, currently for Visual Studio 2021 to still have ABI stability. It's good in some ways. We can build a new executable on our OS with a new version of the compiler and know that our system provided C++ libraries compiled with an older compiler will still work just fine. That's handy. We don't have to recompile all the things all the time just because we got a new version of the compiler. But this makes us stuck. We can never change the return type of a function. We can never add, remove, reorder virtual functions. We can never add, remove, or reorder member variables. We can never add, remove, or reorder function parameters, but we can add new overloads, which does at least partially solve that problem. So what is theoretically lost by not being able to change these things? Standard library might have a bug that would require changing the layout. Sorry, you're stuck with that bug. Would adding or removing a member variable to standard vector increase its performance or save some bytes? Sorry, can't do that. Is there a bug in the design of the standard library that needs to be fixed? Sorry, that's probably an ABI break. That's the theoretical. What have we actually lost so far? Now I'm gonna refer us to this post on Quarantine's blog. This was published back in February 24th of 2020 the day the standard library died. In Prague, the C++ committee took a series of polls on whether to break ABI and decided not to. There was no pause. I'm not sure we fully understood what we did and the consequences it could have. I do believe none of the consequences will be good. So Quarantine goes in and talks about what the ABI is as well in many of the same ways as I did here. There are a few things that we know have been broken. We know that it would be possible to make our associative containers like map and set faster, potentially much faster, if we are willing to break ABI. Standard regex could be made faster if we are willing to break ABI. Small tweaks to string and vector and other container layouts could have significant notable impact. We added a new type called a scoped lock so that we didn't break the ABI by modifying lock guard. And these are higher level constructs for multi-threaded programming. Int 128T has never been standardized because it would require modifying int max T, which would be an ABI break. 
unique pointer could fit into a single register with language modifications uh, would make it zero overhead compared to a pointer. It already mostly is, but there's one possibility of a pointer indirection extra with a unique pointer. That can't be changed. That would be an ABI break. Uh, some fixes to file system can't happen because they would be ABI breaks. We can't make our C library friends constexpr, such as C string, because those would possibly be an ABI break. We can't add UTF-8 support to regex because that would be an ABI break. Lots of things here. You can go on here. Improving shared pointer would be an ABI break. Shared pointer is a very, very heavy, large tool in our arsenal, C++. Now I want to point out this UTF-8 support to regex would be an ABI break. There was an actual submitted proposal to the standard to add full UTF support to regex, but that was turned down because it would at least theoretically be an ABI break. And now I'm not a member of the standard committee, and but I have heard rumors of committee members quitting and leaving the standard over this potential issue because they feel like the language can't move forward if we insist on having ABI stability long-term. Uh, there's also a link here that you can check out later uh, that talks about how Visual Studio has made ABI, maintained ABI conformance since 2015. And a part of this paper also discusses that Visual Studio is not actually going to support. Well, let's go ahead and look at it. They are not going to support the no unique address attribute. And this is uh, because of the potential for causing ABI breaks. Now, uh, I must admit that I'm only recently learning about what no unique address gives us, but it gives us a way of not having to do a bunch of empty base optimization shenanigans that people do to compress the sizes of objects. And if we had no unique address, it would actually simplify a lot of code. And I will try to remember to put a link to a discussion about that when I post this video. So why do we have ABI stability? If so much is lost, potentially or actually, by maintaining ABI stability, why do we have it? My main understanding is that the users demand it. I don't know which users, but the users demand it. They say, I rely on this old library that's I have in binary only form from a vendor or from my own company. It's possible that they created it themselves and somehow lost the source code. The sources are lost or unavailable to us, so I must have ABI stability if I'm going to use the next version of your compiler. So I'm going to have a couple of terms in here. I've got company A and I've got quote binary library, which I've boldened and my new executable. So old binary library is compiled with an old C++ standard library. New executable is compiled with the new C++ standard library. And they're trying to share vector between each other. Now, if vector's layout has changed at all in any way, then binary library and new executable is going to be in the situation where they're using the same words, but they're speaking a different language. And that's really bad. So at this model, standard vector can never change in any significant way. All right, but fine. Does standard vector really need to change? That's a reasonable question, but we already mentioned that there could be fixes to regex, to standard function, to associative containers in general. We are definitely holding things back. So I want to ask, now, I don't have an interactive room here with me, but is company A in a good situation or in a bad situation? Company A has an old binary library of unknown quality. They cannot fix discovered bugs. Well, technically they might be able to patch the binary, but realistically they can't fix discovered bugs. They might be able to work around them. They're probably carrying around undefined behavior and not yet discovered security issues that they cannot fix. Company A says, everything is fine. Our product works. 
But the issue to me is a little more like this. No, company A, your code is already broken. How can I possibly know that company A's code is broken? I mean, realistically, like, how can I just say, oh, all of your old code is broken? Well, I might be using a little bit of hyperbole here, but every major compiler release fixes hundreds of bugs. This is no. Binary library was compiled with an older compiler. Therefore, binary library was compiled with a buggy compiler. Well, sure, your compiler that you're using today is also still buggy, but it's less buggy than the compiler from, well, seven years ago. QED, there we go, I've, I've solved it. I've, I've proven that your code is buggy. Okay, that's a bit of hyperbole, I know, but seriously, when binary library was compiled, it didn't have the advantage of state-of-the-art static analysis, modern compiler warnings, or runtime analysis with sanitizers. These tools get better literally every day. What tools we have available to us. And so you can almost guarantee that your old binary library that you require for your business purposes is buggy because it did not have this analysis available to it. So I say, that by refusing to break ABI, we are encouraging and enabling companies to use old, broken, insecure, and unfixable code that was compiled with a buggy compiler. This only helps enforce the idea that C++ is an insecure language. So to save C++, we must break ABI in the standard library and be willing to break ABI in the C++ standard and start moving forward on some of these issues. This will allow us to fix bugs in the standard library, both in the implementation and in the specification, improve standard library performance in some cases, discourage the use of libraries of unknown quality. This one to me is big. So why haven't we done this yet? Again, I'm not a member of the standard committee, but my understanding is that we have a basically three reasons why. We don't want to splinter the C++ community because of large companies refusing to update compilers and have to deal with this ABI breakage. I'd like to state that just for the record, C++ 11 was an ABI break and we did that and we moved forward and the world didn't collapse and we are actually seeing more adoption of C++ because of the changes that we are willing to make for C++ 11. A silent ABI break is very dangerous. This must be detectable at compile, link, or runtime. If you try to launch a library with an executable and run this, and they are speaking, uh, using the same words, but speaking a different language, things can go very bad very quickly, or worse, go very bad very slowly, and you don't know until the program has been running for some time. So this must be a detectable change. And then what about the people who truly have no other option and they must use an old binary library for some reason? Say it's controlling some piece of $100,000 hardware that they have and they have to use it and the vendor's gone out of business but they want to keep using this hardware. They have no choice. How do we help them? So point one, we don't want to splinter the C++ community because of large companies refusing to update compilers and deal with ABI breakage. Well, newsflash, large companies already cling to old compilers because large companies move slowly. I've done enough training as a C++ trainer to know that plenty of companies just don't upgrade compilers. They don't even have a good reason. They're not like, oh, but we require this old library on this old platform. I mean, sometimes that happens. I've had that. I've heard that come up a few times. Mostly, uh, hey, why haven't you upgraded compilers? Oh, because we haven't yet. That tends to be the answer. Uh, sometimes it comes down to not wanting to have to deal with all the new warnings that a new compiler is going to give them, but that's like the most important reason why they do need to upgrade compilers. Number two, 
A silent ABI break is very dangerous, so this must be detectable at compile, link, or runtime. Must be detectable. We don't want to silently have multiple versions of the standard library that have ABI breakage being used between them. Now, again, I am not a tool vendor, but my argument is that DLL versioning is a solved problem. Every tool chain has some way to deal with different versions of the same library. We've been doing this for decades decades with C libraries. There's no reason we can't do it with the C++ standard library as well, or with some sort of tag in the binary that says, hey, this was compiled with a newer version of C++ that had an ABI break or something like that. This is something that can be solved and I believe is already solved by our tool vendors. That leaves the people who truly have no other option and they must use, you know, old binary library. Option A is to just re-implement this library. It's the best option. It might be a lot of work. It might be nearly impossible. Again, if you're trying to control a piece of proprietary hardware with your binary library that you were given by your hardware vendor, then yeah, that might be bordering on impossible. But it is definitely not impossible because we see all of the time people reverse engineering old games just for the fun of it where they have to decompile old game save file formats and input file formats and stuff and re-implement a game engine so it's certainly doable you just might decide that it's not worth the effort although i would argue that it is worth the effort because you need something that you can maintain and fix moving forward Option B for them is to provide a C wrapper that you could provide an outer layer that protects you. And it would look something like this. You've got a binary library. You've got your binary library. We've been talking about this whole time. And it is linked to your old version of the C++ standard library. And it is linked to your C wrapper API. So you've got some new C library that is using your C++ binary library that is using the old standard uh, C++ standard library. This all thing is wrapped up together as one new C library. And then this C library is what you use from your new executable. This gives us a way of insulating and protecting ourselves when and if this problem happens and you have no way to work around it. And new executable can now freely use whatever C++ libraries it wanted to. Note that this is kind of how Windows system DLLs are written. This insulates us from the different standard library versions. Windows system DLLs are written in a way similar to this. They use C++ internally but with only C facing functions. So they can change the implementation and the linkage and whatever they're doing in these C++ libraries and Windows system DLLs whenever they want to, because they're always gonna give a C facing function outward to the caller, which actually makes using the Windows system DLLs from C++ kind of a pain because we have to use these relatively difficult C interfaces and of course, I'm not suggesting that this be the thing that you always do. I'm providing a back door for you in the case where you need to work around this binary blob problem. It's not ideal, but with some creativity, you can move past an ABI break. And then for bonus points, you can rewrap the C code in a header only C++ library. Why header only? Because then you don't ever have to worry about the ABI. It's just going to compile whatever it needs to look like whenever you go to use it next on the next uh, compiler upgrade that you have. This also has the advantage of making you fully aware of which functions you actually need from your binary library. So if you can go down this road, then you can know, oh, well, you know what? There's actually only like five functions from this thing that we need to re-implement, and we can just rewrite this and get a clean break and move from the past. So I put together a little example here, and I must say that this is actually completely untested, unproven code, but there's a link for it here for you to look at. And now the theory is I've got a C++ library and I've got something called data in it, and I've got a C++ 
member function here called get values that returns a const reference to a vector event. Now the C library that I'm suggesting that you create, it's going to have to be compiled with a C++ compiler because it needs to access C++. So in here, I have extern C, I'm saying this code needs to be compiled and linked as if it were C code. Well, no, I'm saying extern C because any function that's in here needs to have C linkage. That's specifically what we're getting here. I'm providing an opaque pointer. I'm saying there's a struct called C data and it has no members in it. Then I'm also creating a standard span like thing that's got a begin and an end pointer. It's a range, if you will. And this will allow us to easily consume our C exposed things from C++. This is actually legal. So I have a function called new data and I am creating an object of type data and then I'm doing a reinterpret cast to a pointer of type C data. Now that's this opaque pointer thing here that I just created. Now this reinterpret cast is going to look highly suspicious, but it is perfectly valid to convert between pointer types, data pointer types, as long as we never try to actually access that underlying data. So we can go in and out of different pointer types as long as we don't try to access the members. Now C data doesn't have any members. And I am doing this entirely so that the consumer of new data is not tempted to try to peek behind the curtain and actually access this data thing. I want them to say, oh no, I have this thing that's only meant for use with the C API. Now there's probably some better way to do this. I'm just coming right out there and say that. But this is going to give us an option uh, for hiding the implementation from the user. And then I've got delete data, which just reverses this process. It takes the thing passed in, reinterpret cast it to a data star, and then calls delete on it. And now I have data get values. And this is kind of starting to look like a C API, right? I pass in the data object and I get back out the thing. I'm returning by value one of this const vector int range things with this begin and end pointer, which I just construct with the data member from our vector. Now this is going to be perfectly allowed because an int is going to be an int on both sides. It has to be the same on both sides. Otherwise you have no hope of using this old library. And we know that this is going to be laid out contiguously. And so we can just say, well, here is a pointer to int from the beginning to the end. Let's just return that. And now I've closed my extern C here. And in my new C++ executable, I am including C++ 20 span. I'm actually in C++ 20 mode here. I'm creating an object of type new data. I am able to, using a for init block with a ranged for, get the values from this thing, which is this range thing, create a span from that, and then just loop over it. Now I could actually take this one step further by creating free functions. Okay, there we go. We had to do a little bit of tweaking here, but I was able to get rid of the use of standard span by just providing free functions for begin and end, but then I had to make sure that the compiler knew that it needed to call these begin and end free functions to get out the begin and end members. Uh, so that works. Now we're also getting a warning from Clang saying empty struct has size one and uh, zero in C, but size one in C++. So Clang has given us an extra warning here that we need to be concerned about our layout. So let's just go ahead and give this some sort of value in it. So they both have the same size one in both cases. Uh, not that that really matters because we're just passing a pointer to this thing, but it's a dummy data there. All right, so there's possibilities, right? You can provide relatively high level, relatively easy to use C wrappers for your C++ libraries in these cases where you need to work around an ABI issue. So 
break ABI to, C++, to save C++. I think this can be done so we can move forward. There should be a schedule for when it is allowed. Uh, the committee voted to not do it, but they did not come up with a schedule for when it can or would happen next. Now, as co-host for CVPCast, I have conducted some informal polls with all recent CVPCast guests, and I have not had a single person tell me that it is actually important to maintain ABI. Every single person that I've asked that it's actually important to break ABI so that we can move forward on these issues. And I believe it can be done safely and that there is a path forward for people who are stuck with their old binary libraries. So uh, thanks for watching this episode of C++ Weekly. I hope this was helpful and informative, and I hope I did not anger too many people with it.